última palestra do mestre. Vou falar devagar, hoje temos um convidado aí chique, né? Ele é americano, de Los Angeles, mas quase brasileiro. É professor há 11 meses lá na USP, professor lá da USP, do departamento de matemática ou de computação. É, ele vai falar inglês, para os estudantes é muito bom, acho que até temos uma palestra por semestre em inglês, é bom porque estimula vocês e vocês têm que fazer as fases com inglês o mais rápido possível. Né? E geralmente tenta postergar isso. E, mas as perguntas podem ser feitas em português, em ditaduras, né? Bom, então o professor Sinai Hobbes, ele tem um PHD em matemática pela Universidade da Califórnia, Los Angeles, 91. É, seus tops principais de pesquisa são a de, é, com, é, geometria computacional e discreta, teoria dos números e combinatória. E entre 2014 e 2015, foi professor visitante com distinção na Brown University, e onde ensinou lá a análise, análise Fourier junto com o Tony Tops, que, é, como eu falei, foi aprovado em concurso lá na USP, há menos de um ano. É professor titular lá no Instituto, no Instituto de Matemática e Estatística da USP. Então, o professor Sinai, fala devagar, para ajudar os estudantes, tá bom? Por favor. Obrigado. Obrigado. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so, Camila é o perfeito host. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's great to be here. Yeah, thank you. Do you prefer to use microphone? Uh, no, it's okay. Is it, is it okay if I speak like this? Yeah. Uh, Mais ou menos? Is it better now in the back? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, good. Yeah. So, if I I apologize for speaking English, uh, but uh, I was told it's the universal language of science. Uh, so, so on the other hand, I I am really trying hard to learn Portuguese. So, every day. Uh, <laughs> It's a, it's a beautiful language, so it's a pleasure to learn it. But anyway, I've been here on and off for, well, on and off altogether two years, so, but continuously for 10 months. So now, I, 10 months, if, I, if when I'm continuously here for one year, I have no more excuses. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, in any case, uh, this story started a long time ago for me. Yeah, and so I'm going to give you an overview since it's a colloquium of, of a few different fields that uh, the sort of the same te technique comes up in many fields. Uh, so this is joint work with uh, Ricardo Diaz uh, in Colorado and with Nyat Lequan. Nyat is a, uh, well here they are, so here's Nyat. He's now doing a postdoc at uh, Hebrew University, even though he's Vietnamese and doesn't know a word of Hebrew. <laughs> And so it's nice that science is so universal. Um, and Ricardo is originally from New Mexico, and he's American. And I started collaborating with him a long time ago. He's a very good friend, also both of them. But Ricardo is an old friend, collaborator for many years. Ago. So a, a, a lot of this has to do with uh, discrete geometry, but the motivation comes from a very simple idea. The simple idea is to discretize volume. What does it mean to discretize volume? So we take the usual notion of volume of an object and you discretize it. And when I discretize it, I mean using lattices. So the idea of discretizing using a lattice brings in number theory. So lattice, the study of lattices naturally brings in number theory. It also brings in crystallography. So when you bring in a lattice, the Bravelas or any lattices bring in crystallography. So some physics, so hence tiling questions, which I'll talk about. So the crystallography is here, number four. The, the combinatorics, which is, I'm very fond of combinatorics, and so my original, you know, so I, yeah, I, I'm a number theorist by origin, but then combinatorics and discrete geometry because of these problems. So these days I do mostly discrete computational geometry. But the, so the discretization uh, is just a lattice point count. And then there's a different discretization that I want to talk about using angles, local angles, the, extending the notion of a two-dimensional angle to higher dimensions. What does that mean? And then uh, we'll give a quickly, towards the end, a, very, a new description of some discrete volumes that we got recently. Am I speaking too quickly? 
Yeah, so, so I just realized, uh, sorry. So when I get excited, I speak more and more quickly. <laughs> so okay, so I'll try to, yeah. So, uh, so please stop me, by the way, at any point. Please feel free to, to stop me if there's something that's not clear. Or, or even come here and take this out of my hand and point to something. <laughs> Please feel free to do that. Uh, so, what's uh, discrete volume? So the area, the area of a polygon is something that we intuitively understand. Uh, so, the area inside this polygon. To make sense of it uh, rigorously, we need to define measure, measure theory, <laughs> an integral. But we sort of know what it means. And to discretize it, to think of area combinatorially, what does that mean? Well, so here's one way you can, you can think of it. You can put a, a grid, so you put the two-dimensional lattice, the set of all points with integer coordinates. That's the two-dimensional lattice, integer lattice. And you look at each lattice point that's contained inside the polygon and just count. So that's a combinatorial <coughs> count. That's the simplest kind of combinatorial sort of way of discretizing volume. And if you do that, um, so formally you, you sum one at every point in the inter integer lattice which intersects the polytope. So the polytope in this case is a two-dimensional polygon. And you look at the intersection of the object, the polygon, with the two-dimensional integer lattice, and you count. And in this case, if you count, you get uh, 23, the 23 points. And the area, as you can sort of guess, it's not 23. So it's natural to ask how far away are you from the truth, from the true area. And so uh, a second method of uh, discretizing is different. You, put, uh, you count one for each point in the interior, but on the boundary, you do some small change. It's still a finite count, as opposed to an integral. You don't have to integrate. But on the boundary, we're going to weigh each point on the boundary by a local angle. So you put, imagine putting a small sphere centered at, at this point, and a small sphere intersects the polygon, and you look at that little blue angle, and we normalize the angle to be between 0 and 1. So for instance, this is given the weight 1 half, because half the sphere is inside, half the sphere is outside. If this, if this lattice point, the integer point is exactly on the, on the polygon. This is 1 half, this is some angle, this is a little bit more than a half. Etc. So you put these weights, normalize the local solid angles, the local angles between zero and one, and now you ask, let's let's sum these numbers, and what do we get? So, if we do it for this example, um, we sum these local angles, and the local angles for each point in the interior is is one because it's sufficiently small. So you put this, imagine putting a, a little sphere centered at each point and just shrinking it sufficiently small so that. It, you only see the local geometry, and the global geometry is, is not seen. You're just interested in, in a local measurement now. So uh, it turns out that if you do this, for this example, you get 16.5, not, not 23. And uh, yeah, so, so yeah, let's just do, uh, to set the notation for what's to come later. Uh, this is the angle. Omega stands for the angle relative to the object P, which is the polygon, at the point x1. So if x1 is this integer point, the local angle is 1 half. If, uh, if x2 is, is this point here with these integer coordinates, the local angle uh, is 1 because the small sphere is completely contained inside. And here it's just some angle, the angle theta there. And if you do this, you sum all the local angles at every point as, all, as, as the point varies throughout the lattice. So you pick up uh, the local contributions and they all add up to what's called the angle <coughs> polynomial, A for angle, relative to the object P. And you get 16.5. Um, if you compute the area, uh, any guesses what the area is? So the original discrete combinatorial count was 23. This is 16.5. And what's the area? It's sort of hard to guess if you just look at this polygon. You certainly don't want to compute an integral to get the area here. So yeah, the area turns out to be 16.5. So coincidence? Uh, so probably not, right? So we should develop a whole theory to explain this. And that's what we did. 
Uh, and you don't want to stop in two dimensions, you want to go to d dimensions and do it for polytopes and, and keep going. And so the whole theory, so I want to describe the theory to you. So the theory diverges a little bit from the pictures, of course, it has to. And so you need to develop tools. What are the tools? The tools are Fourier analysis. So the Fourier analytic tools, they, they kind of don't care about the dimension, they treat all dimensions equally. Linear algebra, really, right? And uh, the previous uh, combinatorial count uh, was, even though it's nice, this one, even though it's nice and it's simple to understand, sometimes it's beautiful, and it's known as Earhart theory. I spent half my life studying it and working in it, except, except that for some things it's very nice, for some things it's not so nice, and it depends what you want to do. Um, so if you want the exact volume, then this is a better approximation. If you want to, to compute a little bit more efficiently and get a dirty quick answer, then maybe the combinatorial way is a little bit better. Depends on what you want to do. Okay, so this is the solid angle sum, and it's actually, in two dimensions, it's equal to the area, which is kind of a fascinating and beautiful relationship. And it's natural to say, does this persist in three dimensions, for example, four dimensions, five dimensions? Is it always equal to the volume? when you do these local solid angle contributions. So the answer is no, unfortunately, but this, this local solid angle sum, which we denote by A for, for angle, the angle sum is much closer to the true volume than the combinatorial sum. So what happens in higher dimensions? Um, so going back to the combinatorial sum, so I'm giving you two discrete volumes. One, the combinatorial, the, the shear lattice point count, and then the other is the more kind of differential geometric, the solid angle sum. Um, as you can sort of imagine, there are infinitely many ways to discretize. All right? So I'm giving you two discretizations, but there are infinite, you can imagine infinite families of discretizations. Instead of putting a sphere, for example, you might put an ellipsoid locally, or you might put some other object locally. Uh, so anyway, these are two nice discretizations. And if you start with a square, if your object is a square, and we don't have to square by P, and you do the lattice point count, the combinatorics, well, what happens? You sum one at every point. But so now what you, what turns out to be very fruitful is to dilate the object by an integer, let's say T, and keep counting as you dilate. So you dilate by T, you count. You dilate by another T, you count. And if you dial it by an arbitrary parameter t, if t is an integer, it turns out when you count, uh, obviously here it's, we can do the computation, you, you start with a one by one square, that's your object, you dial it by t, you get a t by t square, and when you count the number of points, the combinatorial count gives you t plus one by t plus one, that's t plus one squared, so you get a polynomial in t. And you kind of wonder, well, does this persist in all dimensions, if you have any polytope, so, so I think for this audience, I don't have to define a polytope, right? But so, but, uh, so in any way, so you have any polytope, the natural extensions of polygons in any dimension, and if the vertices are integer points, if they're on a lattice, then is this always true? Do you always get a polynomial? And the answer is yes, and it was proven back in the 60s by um, Earhart. And for the second discrete volume that we gave, the solid angle sums, you also get a polynomial. It's a different polynomial. These are different polynomials associated to cell complexes, to, to polytopes. And the polynomial here, because the, it gives exactly the area, it's just a simpler polynomial, it's just t squared. Because the area of this, of what we started with is one. So you get the area times the dilation, so it's simpler. Um, yeah, so last point, the first kind of application is last point enumeration in polytopes. The classic example. So these are the two discrete volumes we gave so far. The first is known as the Earhart polynomial, which is a way to discretize using combinatorics and, a, and an integer lattice, let's say. And the second one is you start with the same object, P. P is a polygon or P is a polytope. And the second one is using local solid angles like we did the, to get the 16.5. Um, advantages and disadvantages. The, this is, a, as we said, much better approximation to the volume. It's hard to compute locally, though. So locally, as you can imagine, even in three dimensions, locally, you're putting a sphere, you're intersecting the sphere with that polytope, so you're getting a spherical triangle. Higher dimensions, you're getting spherical tetrahedra. And even it, to compute a single spherical tetrahedra is challenging. 
So locally it's challenging to compute, globally it's nice actually. So locally it's difficult, globally it's nice. Here it's sort of the opposite. Locally it's easy because you're just assigning one, but globally it's difficult. So it's trade-off. Here's the, the man, Earhart, of this field of discrete geometry, and it's kind of the beginning of this whole field of discretizing volumes. Um, so he says, in the 50s, he proved that if P is an integer polyglot, any this means all the vertices lie exactly on the lattice, then uh, the combinatorial discrete volume is exactly a polynomial in dilation parameter. You, you start with a polytope P, you dilate by any <coughs> integer T, you count, you get exactly a polynomial, so who's the first to prove it? And uh, the coefficients are still mysterious today. You still don't know exactly when they're positive, when they're negative. You don't know exactly the, the precise geometric content of the coefficients. We do know that for a convex polytope, the con if you assume it's convex, the constant is always one. If it's not convex, the constant term will be the Euler characteristic of the object. So it captures some topology. And we know that the limit term is always the volume, and we know that the co we even know a formula for this. It turns out to be, I'll give you a formula later, but it's one half the volume of the surface area, basically, normalized surface area with respect to the sub lattice on each facet. And Earhart has an interesting history. He never got a PhD in his life, he just taught high school, but he wrote, he published his papers in the best journals, uh, Crella, so this is kind of the, the oldest journals in all of mathematics. And, so he got a lot of recognition for his work, uh, but he just kind of came out of nowhere and did all this beautiful work, and everybody loved it and started working in it, and they said, well, why don't you get a PhD? And he goes, well, I'm 60. I just started doing this last year. <laughs> so he was 60 when he started, I think, and uh, so he got honorary PhDs from France. He was in France at the Lycée or something. Uh, so it's kind of funny history. Um, and yeah, so he also showed, uh, so he knew everything. He showed that uh, the co-dimension one coefficient is one half the volume of the boundary properly normalized. When we say properly normalized, I actually mean, I can describe it. So each facet of the polytope passes through a D minus one dimensional fat, uh, lattice, right? So if you have a three dimensional polytope, for example, a facet is a two dimensional face. The two dimensional face, the hyperplane passing through it, the affine space that it defines, passes through a two-dimensional sub-lattice of the three-dimensional integer lattice. Relative to a fundamental domain on that two-dimensional sub-lattice, if you define that fundamental domain to have volume one, relative to that, uh, you compute the volume of each facet, and then you add, so that's what this means. So it's, it's kind of digital geometry, if you like, or, or lattice geometry, discrete geometry. Okay, uh, or Earhart also proved if you have a rational polytope, you start with a rational polytope, which means the coordinates are rational numbers, not just integers now, so it's a little bit more flexible, a lot more flexible. Then you, you get something called a quasi-polynomial. It's not a polynomial, but the coefficients are now periodic functions of the dilation. So these are periodic functions. They have finite Fourier series, for example. And t is still an integer. So you start with a rational polytope, you dilate by an integer, and now you get a quasi-polynomial. The coefficients are periodic functions of t. Um, a lot of current research is, is done on, on these quasi-polynomials. Um, yeah, so I had a PhD student, I'm embarrassed to say when now. Let's see, so uh, my first PhD student, so 1990, uh, no, sorry, he finished in 2001, Matthias Beck, so we wrote a, a book together, and now, Kind of funny how life goes. So, so just uh, three years ago, I met some guy who's working on this, and Matthias goes, "Oh, so this is your grandson?" Because <laughs> so, I'm his student now. Uh, it's kind of funny. Uh, so, so yeah. So each coefficient uh, gives some interesting information about the case skeleton. So the discrete geometry is beautiful. You start with a, a an object, polytope P. The polytope has, uh, if you like graph theory, so the the one skeleton is a graph, right? But then you can look at the two skeleton, right? The, the, the two dimensional faces, or the three skeleton, the three dimensional faces, or the four skeleton, and so on. And, and you can capture information about that k skeleton, the, the union of the k dimensional faces. And that information is captured by the kth coefficient here. What exactly does it capture is not really known yet, but we have some formulas, etc. Then it can sums come up a lot. So. 
So solid angle sum, so a more symmetric kind of discrete volume. So this is what we described in the beginning. So locally, you sum these local solid angles, which intuitively is clear. And you get a similar theorem to Erhard. The theorem is that uh, you start with a polytope, integer polytope, you dilate by T, you do these local sums, you have a, a second form of discrete volume, and you also get a polynomial in T, and it's closer to the true volume, as you sort of expect from the two-dimensional example. And it's indeed true, and you see a very interesting thing here, is every other coefficient vanishes. So, so it is indeed closer to the volume because there is no t to the d minus one term. So it's big O of t to the d minus two. So it is really closer to the volume. And we're not the first to, to prove this. We just gave a different proof. But uh, Erhard, uh, actually Erhard uh, conjectured, uh, Erhard proved it actually, he proved it. And then he conjectured something about it called the reciprocity law. And then McDonald, Ian McDonald, uh, the guy who works on commutative algebra, algebraic geometry, finally proved it. Um, yeah, so here is a, just a, to be very concrete, here is a three simplex, and here is a point, and to compute a local sound angle, you intersect the sphere with the object, and it turns out that for three dimensions, a local sound angle at the, at the boundary, which is uh, a one simplex, which is an edge, uh, is also, the, the local sound angle is the, is the same as the dihedral angle, so it's the same. That for three dimensions, the solid angle at a, at a point on an edge is the same as the, the angle between the facets. So you can start talking about the hedral angles and do some geometry, some classical geometry. So you can combine modern geometry, classical geometry. And it's very nice. You get some very nice results. Peter McMullen did a lot of beautiful work on this. Uh, many other people as well. Uh, so this is the, the solid angles. So the solid angle is, uh, yes, locally, this is just uh, saying you take a volume if you compute a solid angle at x, this is exactly what we're saying. You just put a small sphere of radius epsilon at x, see how much it intersects the object, take the volume, and normalize it with respect to the, to the volume of the sphere. So that, that's the same thing we're saying. Um, so what does the Fourier transform have to do with anything? Why, why should we look at the Fourier transform of, of the polytope to do all this stuff? So that's kind of the main thing that, yeah, so I've been writing a book about this now for four years, and the reason I haven't finished is because I don't have a co-author like I did before, so nobody bugs me. I have to bug myself. Have you ever tried this? <laughs> anyway, so, so what, what, does the, what does the Fourier transform have to do with anything? Um, okay, so I'm not going to assume you know about Fourier transforms. So what is the Fourier transform of a triangle? You take a triangle in a plane. Let's take a very simple example. A triangle whose vertices are 0, 0, A0, and 0, B. And the Fourier transform is, by definition, you take this complex exponential and just integrate it over your triangle. So it's calculus 2. It's a two-dimensional integral of some nice exponential function over the triangle. The reason it's very nice is because these complex exponentials form a basis for a very nice space of functions. You can expand many functions into this infinite basis of a complex exponentials, and that's called Fourier series. And uh, it's a little bit nicer than Taylor series because the space of functions that are allowed is much larger. And so, and, and in particular, the exponential function has a nice antiderivative. We know how to take the antiderivative from an exponential, so it's very nice. So you can use so-called higher dimensional integration by parts, which is just Stokes' formula. Or in the plane, you know it as Green's theorem. In general, it's Stokes' theorem. And so physicists would say, okay, integration by parts in, in, in all dimensions. And so this is, so you can do that. And in fact, later, that's what we do. But um, so one, so one, there, there are very, very many beautiful things about the Fourier transform. One nice thing is that we get very lucky and there are actually closed forms. This is a closed form for the Fourier transform of a, of a triangle. These closed forms are due to Michel Brion in 1988 and 1991, he reproved it. But the original theorem is 1988, but it's such a beautiful result that that rewrites this Fourier transform of a polytope in terms of a finite linear combination of some things that look like this. Um, that uh, that theorem from Brion from 1988 could have been, which is basically this theorem, it's an expansion in, high, in all dimensions, that could have been proved 100 years before, it just wasn't noticed. And so, 
one, so there are two nice things. One is you, you, you because of Mjolnir, you can expand this into these kind of almost rational functions of z. So this is a rational function of z, where z has several coordinates, several variables. And, but uh, the only thing that's, that separates it from rational functions are these complex exponentials and enumerators. That's the only, the only difference. Otherwise, it's kind of close to algebraic geometry or something, but it's, it has these complex exponentials in the numerator. And anyway, so engineers are starting to use this as well because moments, so if you want to compute moments of objects, this is a very handy way to compute moments. And so uh, another nice thing about this is it's a very natural generalization of the notion of volume. So if you want to generalize the notion of volume, um, when you plug in z equals zero, so it's a function of z, right? If you plug in z equals zero on the left-hand side, and notice what happens, z equals zero, you get the integral of one, and if you integrate one over the object, that's by definition the volume. So, so you, it, it just that uh, a function, a space of functions on your object always gives you more flexibility than just assigning one number, the volume. It's always nicer to have a whole space of functions, and then hopefully you have identities between these functions. You can you have more play. You go back and forth, and then you 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 retract back down to what you're interested in, the volume. Um, so these are called exponential rational functions because of these exponents. And uh, in in general dimension, it's just defined in the same way. You integrate the indicator function. This is the indicator function of the object. So one sub p of x, it's it defined to be one for whenever x is in p, zero whenever x is outside of p. So th this being an indicator function is just exactly this integral over p. So in other words, the transform of polytope is nothing more than integrating over the polytope. For instance, a tetrahedron, you integrate over a tetrahedron, this exponential. And the beautiful thing is there are many useful formulas. And the technology has evolved over the last 10 years to the point where we can now do things very well. Not completely, but we can do things much better than we could 20 years ago. And so it's a useful generalization of the, of the natural notion of volume. Is this clear? Because I, I'm not assuming any, any Fourier analysis. It wouldn't be fair. So, okay, so, so that's, the, that's the utility of the Fourier transform. One utility is it generalizes naturally volume. Another one is you can have identities of, of some funny nature that you know, if you haven't seen them before, they're kind of amazing identities. Uh, all of these, all of this technology that's been developed recently in recent years for for your transfer polytopes is apl applicable first to simple polytopes. So, sorry, I've been picking up speed. So, a simple polytope is a polytope such that at every vertex, the number of edges that comes out of that vertex is the same for every vertex, and it's equal to the dimension, the ambient dimension of the polytope. So if the polytope is d-dimensional, at every vertex there are exactly d edges coming out of it. If you like graph theory, the one skeleton is a d-regular graph. Um, the state of affairs is for simple polytopes, the, all the, everything becomes trivial. All the formulas sort of become trivially so everything is nice for simple polytopes and very, I shouldn't say completely trivial, but that's the simple thing. So all, everybody, all the theorists always apply the theory first to simple polytopes. Um, and then it's very, it's NP-hard, somebody proved it's NP-hard in general to compute the Fourier transform of, of a non-simple, an arbitrary polytope. You can imagine why it's NP-hard because it's, it's hard to compute volume. And so if you could compute this fast, you could just plug in z equals zero and just get a trivial computation for the volume, which is known to be NP-hard. Um, here's a dodecahedron. So is this a simple polytope? Oh, I gave you the answer. Okay, it is. Because every vertex has exactly three edges. Here's a cube. Every vertex has exactly three edges. That's also a simple polytope. So, so if you like these kind of crystal structures, which crystallographers love, then you can compute all these transforms easily. The octahedron. This is kind of a nasty creature. So <laughs> this is the dual of the cube, and yet the dual is not so nice. So simplicial, the dual is simplicial. Every face is a, is a simplex. But uh, here, the vertex has degree 4. And so it's not equal to the dimension. So it's not simple. 
Uh, this one, it sits in three dimensions, so if it's simple, every vertex should have degree three, so it's not simple. Uh, however, things that look sort of not simple, technically it's a non-simple polytope, it's called. Sometimes you can still compute the Fourier transform by tricks, so it turns out there are tricks. Crystallographers like these tricks as well, and you want to know when things tile space and so on. Uh, so now we get to tilings and multi-tilings. And how, so how can you use the Fourier transform to tile space? Um, so yeah, this is called the Fedorov solid. This is one of Fedorov solids. This is one of the five polyhedra in three space that tile by translations only. So the cube, you know tiles by translations only. You can visualize it. This one also tiles by translations only. It's harder to visualize, but it does. So crystallographers, of course, it comes up naturally in a certain molecular structure. I forgot the name of it, but um, all these are, were studied by Fedorov in 1885, 1884, and he classified these completely in, 18, in the 1880s. Uh, turns out there are five of them. They have nothing to do with the platonic solids, except for the cube. Uh, so they're different. It just turns out to be five also. Um, this is definitely not a platonic solid, but it's one of the five things that tile space by translations only. And it turns out you can use the Fourier transform of, the, of this object to tell you exactly how it tiles and so on, and, and finer structure. So there's uh, Minkowski, whom you heard about, probably. So Minkowski in 1897 classified um, uh, the convex polytopes the tile, uh, partially classified. He gave a necessary sufficient, uh, necess um, gave a necessary condition. He said if it, if it tiles by translations, if you have a polytope in Euclidean space, d-dimensional Euclidean space tiles by translations, then it must be symmetric and all the facets must be symmetric. But he didn't, he didn't uh, know about condition three, and condition three had to wait 50 years after Minkowski and Venkov and McMullen independently found condition three, and now we have a nice if and only if condition for tiling by translations. But even though it's a nice if and only if condition that tells you, I, I probably don't have time to go into this, but it tells you exactly how, you know, when theoretically things tile, it, you still don't know how many combinatorially distinct things tile in every dimension. For example, in R4, four dimensions, why are there exactly 52? So it was a big open problem. There was known to be 51 up until five years ago or six years ago, and some computer scientists finally, and mathematicians, nailed the 52nd one. Um, even though they knew about this, even only if they still, it's still hard to actually find all of them in every dimension. In dimension five, there are a few thousands in fact, so in dimension five, uh, oh, I should update my slide here. Uh, a few a few months ago, I think, uh, just this year, a PhD student in Germany finished his PhD and classified dimension five completely in his thesis. I forgot his name. Uh, I should put his name here. And that PhD student found 118,000 distinct ones in dimension five. That was quite a search. Uh, so that was impressive. So now dimension five is done. But in dimension six, how many are there, etc. we don't know. Um, here's an example of what it means to multi-tile. So, so we know about tiling because crystallographers do this all the time. To multi-tile means to cover every point the same number of times. So if you like, it's an exact covering. But, so here's an example. You take this octagon and translate it by the vector 1, 1, and translate it again by the vector 2, 1, translate it again by the vector 3, 1, by the vector 2 minus 1, so, so this is the origin, let's say, so this is 2 minus 1. And translate it again and again, and uh, after translating seven times you get this, and if you look at this blue triangle, that blue triangle was covered exactly seven times. And if you keep translating by all the integer vectors, every point will be covered exactly seven times. Except for the boundary, of course, that's, all, that's always an exception, the boundary and its translates. But outside the boundary, and every point will be covered seven times, except for the boundary and its translates. So, so that's called a multi-tiling. And so then a natural extension of tiling is to ask which objects multi-tile, when do they multi-tile, and how do they translate, which translation vectors. And so we started to, to answer these questions in the last five years, six years, more. Um, and so, yes, I wrote some papers with some people. One of them is Mihalis Kolonzakis, a very good harmonic analyst. So, yeah, so I do harmonic analysis on discrete geometry. And, and so Mihalis, uh, 
had a very beautiful lemma. It's kind of folklore. I attribute it to Mihalis because he's worked the longest out of any of us uh, on these things. And so uh, a convex polytope admits a k tiling, so every point gets covered the same number of times uh, by translations with some lattice, let's say, if and only if um, the Fourier transform of the object, which is what we define, vanishes at every point in the dual lattice. Okay, so the object tiles with a lattice L, if the Fourier transform has a zero set which contains in it the dual lattice to L. Very beautiful, and if and only if. And so the harmonic analysis comes as a nice if and only if criterion, if, assuming you can compute the Fourier transform of the object. And now the technology, again, is evolved to the point where we sort of can. We can in a lot of, in a lot of cases. So, and k, and k has to be necessarily, this is not hard to see, k necessarily has to be the volume of the object normalized by the fundamental domain, which is a, one of the cells of the, of the lattice. So, so this is a nice, uh, um, again, uh, another place where the Fourier transform of the, of the polytope comes in very naturally in translations. Uh, it's not so surprising, maybe, if you know some Fourier analysis, it's not so surprising, especially if you know the Poisson summation formula. And it's not so surprising if you think of Fourier analysis as an abelian theory. It's, 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 a theory, it's an abelian theory in the sense that you're translating, so you have an abelian group of translations. Uh, so that's the classical Fourier analysis. If you allow rotations, which we're not talking about today, but if you allow rotations, you have a non-abelian theory. And then you have to look at, at the uh, Fourier analysis with respect to the orthogonal group. And then it gets much more complicated. And then you have to, and then representation theory comes in. And so, so representation theory is another very useful thing that we use a lot in number theory. And the representation theory of the orthogonal group will allow you to extend these things to non-abelian things, which is rotations. That's been done recently. I'm having a hard time to make together the k of the ratio and the example of the number seven appears. Ah, so, so k is equal to seven in that example. And the volume, the, the determinant of the lattice was one because it was the integer lattice. So k was seven. But but you, oh, you're asking why? Oh oh oh. Oh okay. Um, the way you see it out of the harmonic analysis is you take. Um, let's see if I wrote it here. No. So you take the you take you can take the the definition of multi-tiling, and the definition of multi-tiling gives you immediately by definition a, a periodic function. You take that periodic function with respect to the lattice that it, that it translations. So any periodic function has a Fourier series. You expand it in a Fourier series. And the fact that, that you, um, you get a k tiling means that, that Fourier series, you expand the Fourier series, but it's, it's equal to also a constant k. So a certain Fourier series is equal to constant. So the first coefficient must be equal to the constant, the constant is k, the first coefficient of the Fourier series is the Fourier transform at zero, which is the volume. And so that's the proof that the volume is k. And then all the other Fourier coefficients must be zero because it's equal to a constant. And by uniqueness of Fourier series, if the Fourier series is equal to a constant, all of them must vanish. And, and so that's, I'm, I'm walking you through the proof of this lemma. So it's not a hard lemma. And so, so the proof through harmonic analysis that this is the seven from the example is that the that's the constant term of a Fourier series. But, but you can see it asymptotically but as well. So uh, yeah, so we can study. So the point is uh, of all this stuff is to study the Fourier transform, the vanishing of the Fourier transform. So it's not vanishing of polynomials like classical ge uh, algebraic geometry, but it's vanishing of these, um, uh, of these kind of quasi uh, exponential, exponential rational functions these funny exponentials in the numerators. So, so the numerators of these, so this is a finite linear combination of certain um, exponential rational functions. Okay, uh, all these people studied uh, s similar things. And yeah, here's just a nice picture um, of, uh, of a solid angle in three dimensions. So it's, it's a volume of a spherical triangle. 10 minutes? Thank you. So, it's, so we get the volume of a spherical triangle. And yeah, finally, uh, towards the end here, I want to show you kind of a, uh, so we remained, we remained kind of uh, sort of vague until this point. And so uh, in the last few minutes, uh, if you allow me, I just want to show you some details, but I can point you to uh, some papers on the web if you want to see more detail. But 
I feel, you know, so I feel a little bit like I'm cheating if I don't show you some more details, but on the other hand, you don't want to see too much detail, so. Anyway, so, so uh, as you can sort of see, I'm very excited about the sound angle polynomial because, well, because we can, one reason is because we can say more about it, Another reason is it is closer to the volume, and, and uh, third is it combines kind of classical differential geometry with discrete geometry with combinatorics. And so going back to these local angle contributions that we saw in the picture, uh, this is the solid angle polynomial, so you, you, you attach these local solid angle contributions at every point um, for P, so assume P is an integer polytope, let's say. So and you look at the so so again this is the this is the intersection of a small sphere centered at the point n which intersects the dilated polytope tp and you sum all those and you get by poisson summation techniques you get uh, some description of these coefficients so so if you allow me i'll just give you a quick description even though it can't be so quick but i'll i'll give you kind of uh, just so you see the the kind of machinery that goes into it it turns out that these coefficients, in general, if you allow a general real t, oh yeah, so one of the things that we're able to do in the last five years is extend things from integer t to arbitrary real t. So you can expand by any real parameter, you don't have to restrict anymore to integers. And doing so allows you to conclude all these funny theorems that now you get some similar thing and it's, now it's any real t, and now these coefficients are real functions with period one. Um, Assuming we start with our uh, yeah. rational polytope. Okay. Um, here's a funny formula. Um, so fairly recent. Uh, generalizing the formulas of of in the '60s of Earhart and, and Ian McDonald and all these people, uh, but you have to at the cost of introducing something called the Bernoulli polynomials. So it turns out all these coefficients are kind of based on Bernoulli polynomials and extensions of Bernoulli polynomials. But uh, why Bernoulli polynomials? Well, they, they come up naturally when we do Euler-Maclaurin summation. So the modern kind of version of this is Euler-Maclaurin summation formulas. But in any case, this is, this is a very easy function to define. I just want to tell you, so, so this is the co-dimension one coefficient, AD minus one of T. So remember, this was zero before, when T was an integer, and P was an integer polytope, I told you this was zero, right? That was a theorem from the 60s by Earhart and so on. These were zeros, every other coefficient was zero. But now if T is allowed to be real, you see the alternate life of this. It's no longer zero. It's still zero for every integer T, that's true, but it has an alternate life. And now we see kind of the hidden life of this if you extend to all T, so which is also beautiful. So now this is zero for integer T, but for all T it's given by a weird formula. Where, where this funny function is the first Bernoulli polynomial, and it's just defined by this. It's sometimes called the sawtooth function. So, um, yeah, I forgot to draw a picture, but it's, it's, it, it's periodic and it looks, it's linear, and then, so it's, it's y equals x, and then between zero and one, and then you chop it off and then you periodize it. So it's called the sawtooth function. It looks like a saw, like a saw. And so it has a very nice Fourier series, and using the Fourier series, you can get closed forms like this. So that, that, that uh, tell you the, uh, something about the geometry of the polytope and as, as well about the structure of these functions. So this is the Fourier series for the first, it's very simple, right? It's just the Fourier series of the first periodic Bernoulli polynomial. And the fact that it's so simple lets us prove these kinds of formulas. So, uh, oh, by the way, n shouldn't be zero, so it's a typo. I should omit, obviously, uh, the 11th commandment, thou shalt not divide by zero. So I have to omit zero. Uh, yeah, so this is the, but it's, all these Bernoulli polynomials are just basically like this, except you raise n to some power. So the b sub two, you raise n to the two power, b sub three, you raise n to the three power. So they're all kind of the same. And they come up in number theory a lot. These are the, when we study the Riemann zeta function, these are the analogs of the Riemann zeta function called the Hurwitz zeta function. And so a lot of number theory can come in uh, if, you want, if you want to do that. And we gave formulas for all of the coefficients in terms of some infinite Fourier series. And so the formulas, yeah, okay, so here are the formulas. Uh, I know it looks like a mess, and uh, it is a mess, but uh, it's a doable mess, it turns out. So it turns out that, uh, yeah, this is a finite sum. This is a, a certain infinite sum, but, but it, 
very often this infinite sum collapses to a Bernoulli polynomial, like like they did here. So, so in practice, okay. So in practice, you can't always. We have a very explicit description of these coefficients. This is very some explicit rational function, some explicit exponential function, r for rational, e for exponential, and then this is the Gaussian. So you kind of damp things with Gaussian, like statisticians do, and then you sum these Gaussians, and you get theta functions, blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, you want a very concrete formula for these coefficients so you can compute discrete volumes. And you can do it in practice, but um, this is some work to be done to do it more generally. I mean, yeah, so it's a, a bit of a mess, but, but it's a very explicit mess. Uh, yeah, maybe I shouldn't go into exactly, we don't have time to go into exactly, but there's something called a face poset. Of a, if you have a product, the face poset is the partially ordered set of faces. The faces are, are form a partially ordered set ordered by inclusion, and you can do combinatorics on, the, on a face poset, and you look at flags, which is, just means a vertex containing some edge, containing some face, containing some high dimensional face. If you look at all flags, and to each flag you attach a certain rational function, you sum those, you get these formulas. Um, yeah, pretty pictures, etc. And yeah, some more formulas of rational functions. Probably I shouldn't go into this. I should. I should probably delete these. Anyway, and then you get finally uh, some nice, some nice uh, functional equations. Which um, yeah. So so if you plug, if you, if you so this formula, uh, this uh, formula we had, which extends the solid angle polynomial for all real t. <laughs> So that's true for all real t. If you plug in minus t, it turns out it has an extension to the minus domain, to, to negative uh, real numbers. And uh, if you plug in minus t, you get something in, in terms of the original function. And quite often what happens is if you plug in uh, there's these things called reciprocity laws, geometric reciprocity laws, if you plug in, plug in a negative number, you get another expression which represents the interior of the geometric object. So, so you define a polynomial, or some zeta function, you plug, you, you extend, analytically continue it, analytically continue it to some other domain, you plug in a negative value, and all magically it represents a different aspect of the geometry. Uh, yeah, so uh, back to this, yeah, so here's, here's again the, the uh, transform of the, of the triangle, and here's a shameless plug for the book if you want to see more about discrete volumes. This is the combinatorial discrete volume. This is my former student, Matthias Beck. And uh, by the way, so I, there's a very beautiful, uh, if you look, if you go back, if you go to this, uh, if you go to this uh, link, you'll see that this turns into a soccer ball. So I, I was, I was excited to show it to you, but then I, I couldn't, uh, I, 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 anyway, yeah. So if you go to a, if you go to this link, the, this, it forms a double cover of a soccer ball, and uh, uh, using some uh, number theory. Uh, okay, I'll stop there. Questions? So uh, the Fourier transform of these polytopes, I noticed that. Uh, so they compactly supported these functions. So Absolutely. does paley wiener theory play a role here? Because it seems like these are holomorphic entire functions. They are. They're entire functions precisely because of what you said. It's compact, so you can differentiate under the legal sign infinitely often. So yeah, so they're entire. Um, does that play a role or in any way? Or? Um, well, we use the fact that they're entire. Well, the fact that they're these finite sum of, of these rational functions is, a, is can be a little misleading because the rational functions have singularities, but as you just and notice the singularities must be removable. Uh, yeah. But however, it's still useful to write it as a finite linear combination of things with singularities because it's very compact. And so if you write it that way, computationally, it's, it's incredible. Uh, there's a very simple example of this, just uh, it, when we were in kindergarten or elementary school, and we, we now learned that one plus x plus x squared plus x cubed plus x to the fourth, the geometric series is one over one minus x. Um, so one, one, so it's an, an, completely analogous to this. The geometric series is kind of the left-hand side, the integral, analogous to the integral, and you can go up to infinity and, and keep computing forever, or you can just do one over one minus x. The left-hand side is, is entire, well, um, the right-hand side, one over one minus x, has a singularity. It's exactly the same kind of phenomenon. Because I noticed that in one of those lemmas, the folklore lemma, one of the conditions, I don't remember the name of the lemma, but yeah. the condition, one of the conditions was about the zero sets containing the dual of something. So yeah. I mean, because 
they're kind of rigid in the sense of being entire, so the zero sets have to have a certain, and probably they have some growth conditions as well. Because they do, yeah. In fact, so, that, that's what these guys... So the zeros are of a certain type. Yes, yeah. so Terry Tao got into it also. Yeah, so, so, th so these guys study the growth conditions, exactly. But uh, I wanted kind of a more precise, so I, I was interested in tiling, uh, they're interested in certain growth conditions for perhaps Paley Wiener or, or other Fourier analytic uh, corollaries. But uh, if you're interested in geometric tiling, then you want to detect exactly when a lattice is in a zero set. And so that, that was that was the only thing. I, but you're right. Yeah, you can. I guess you can play other games. Yeah, I mean, it seems very beautiful. The, the connections to so many things, modular forms, perhaps also. It yeah, seems like so that's there might be. that's what I grew up on. Yeah, so you. Uh, so, so I love the modular forms. I always try to connect them. I was able to connect them to some extent in, in a paper about three, four years ago. Yeah, so cone theta functions. I can extend co uh, theta functions to cones. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Thank you. Marcelo vai perguntar ali. Quem quiser perguntar em português, tentamos traduzir. Então, alunos, não fiquem. We are using uh, the Fourier transform to study tiling, the multi tiling of a uh, continuous phase by that uh, discrete structure. Yes. Uh, do you know if it's possible to use the discrete Fourier transform or something of uh, Krautrup polynomial th things like that uh, to study tilings of a discrete structure by a discrete structure? That means a covering of uh, a graphs with some properties by families of subgraphs, things like that. Um, let's see. Uh, yes and no. <laughs> I know of some problems. I don't know how to solve them. <laughs> yeah, so yes, you're right. Uh, so here's one very, along the lines of what you're asking, here's a very beautiful problem that I would love to solve if somebody has an idea. So take the two-dimensional integer lattice, uh, take a finite subset of integer points, 1, 1, 5, 10, just a finite subset, and suppose it tiles the lattice, so you get a tiling of a discrete structure by a finite subset. So suppose it tiles, uh, must it be periodic? So it's unsolved. Does it always have to be periodic? It's not known. Uh, can you give any description of finite subsets of the integer lattice? Which tile the integer lattice? Nothing is really known about this. Can you use finite for analysis? Sure. Uh, but how much does it give you? I don't know. Uh, there is an analog of uh, the, one of the, my favorite methods that comes from modular forms and number theory is Poisson summation. The Poisson summation formula has an analog for finite abelian groups. There is a, and, and quadratic polynomials come up in that. Um, for the finite analog of Poisson summation formula for at least for finite abelian groups, you can do some stuff in coding theory. So it has applications to coding theory, uh, the finite version of, of these kinds of techniques, some of them. Uh, in particular, Poisson summation and and the um, uh, let's see. So, what is the name of the theorem? I'm trying to think. There's a, there's a very McWilliams. McWilliams, thank you. Yeah, the McWilliams theorem is very beautiful. Um, yeah. But other than that, for graph theory, there should be. I agree, there should be things, but I don't know. If, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Do you, do you know a theorem uh, called Pick's theorem? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so yeah. I, I want to understand the relation between your theorem about angles and, and Pick's, Pick's theorem. Yeah, that's how I started like uh, 20 years ago or something with Pick's theorem. Yeah, so uh, the relation is, yeah, so I can, one of the proofs I gave of that uh, is using Pick's formula. Um, the way you can do it, uh, there's one beautiful proof of, of Pick's formula, there's many proofs now, but one beautiful proof is in this really nice book, Proofs from the Book, which you've probably seen. Currently, it's, I think maybe all of you have seen that book by that book now, uh, Proofs from the Book, it's edition number five now or something. And one beautiful proof in there uh, by Martin Eigner and Gunther Ziegler is, uh, Taking a triangle, taking a polygon, and using every integer point inside to triangulate everything into unimodular triangles. For each unimodular triangle, um, I'm, I'm going to run you through the proof to answer your question. So, for each unimodular triangle, you can compute a solid uh, the angle sum, and it's so it, for, it turns out to be one half. 
So it's one half plus one half plus one half, and you add one halves uh, the number of times of triangles you get. And using Euler's formula, you can relate the triangles to the boundary and the area. And so, so that gives that kind of an outline of a proof. But you can look at the details. Uh, and if you're wondering, yeah, if you're wondering how to go further, you can feel free to email. Uh, okay. And um, I've heard there's no generaliz generalization to other dimensions. Well, this so theorem. But they're the inherent the polynomials, right? Yes, yeah, so inherent polynomials are the closest kind of traditionally that people have gotten to extensions. So it depends which. So then the question is, what is the question? So the question becomes, what is the question? Mm -hmm. And if you define your question very carefully, uh, like is there a linear relationship between area and points? So the answer is easily no, there's no more linear relationship. Is there a polynomial relationship? The answer is yes, there is a polynomial given by these theorems of Erhard. Um, but it depends what the question is, uh, right? Um, so for, for me, a lot of, uh, the question becomes what are the atomic pieces of the formulas? And the atomic pieces become Dedekind sums, which we didn't have time to go into. But. Thank you. Perguntas, questions, uma questão em português. Uh, for functions, only when, you, when you perform the Fourier transform, you have the frequency content of the function. There is any geometric interpretation for the Fourier transform of a polynomial? What will be the of a polynomial? Of a polynomial. Of a polynomial. Of a polynomial. Sorry. Of a polynomial. Uh, is there, when you say geometric interpretation? Yeah, because for functions, it's the frequency content. Here in the polytope, we have no measure for the variable. Suppose that is length. So the Fourier, uh, the Fourier variable like z is one over length. And then you have the, the Fourier. There is any geometric, what is this meaning? Um, just, just, uh, just wondering. I don't know how to answer that. It's interesting. I, I, I don't know. Uh, this could you give you any information about the geometry of the object, the original object, like the Fourier gives you like an X-ray for frequency. Oh yeah, yeah, that's, that it certainly yeah. does. Yeah, so the Fourier transform of the polytope does give you geometric information like the X-ray uh, of the object. Okay. That it does. So I wrote another paper about six years ago with some people about something like that, recovering the object from this X-ray information. So every Fourier transform, if you differentiate it under the equal sign, because as you noticed, it's analytic. If you differentiate it, you get these moments. So you can integrate yeah, no, moments. Yeah, they do have all the details. Yeah. And it's about geometric. Geometrically, if you, you have a polytope, yeah. then you have the Fourier transform. That's also in R2. Suppose that the polytope is in two dimensions. Uh -huh. The Fourier transform is also it's complex, but like four dimensional. You know, but if you consider only Z1 and Z2, like in that example you give in R2. Right, right. So you have uh, something in R2 in, in two dimensions. There is any geometrical meaning for that? That's my question. Um, yeah, it, yeah I, don't, I don't completely know. If you restrict, I did do some research on it uh, with some students, undergraduates, uh, to try to visualize the Fourier transform. Okay. And if you restrict it to real Z1 and Z2 in the plane, oh, okay. so you can see it, okay. then you get a countable union of curves. Uh, the zero set uh, contains a countable union of curves, and so you can look at this countable union and kind of see, and so just like X-ray crystallography, if you zoom out, this, this countable union of curves starts looking asymptotically more and more like the dual of the original. So that, that's, that's what happens in crystallography. But other than that, I don't know. It's very complicated, right? So I don't know. I don't know if you, if you can detect geometry that you... So it's sort of like listening to frequencies and, and saying, do the frequencies form a geometric object? Yeah, yeah. It's hard yeah, to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the other question is about... Uh, uh, there are many people for image in image using the quaternionic Fourier right. transform. Right, which is useful, very either. useful. Yes, but for images it's wonderful. You have three, you, instead yeah. of one, you have three yeah, yeah. states. Yeah, 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 yeah. Are you doing something about that? No. No, but uh, computationally it's very efficient for computer vision and so on, I know that, but I, I haven't worked on it directly. Thank you. Bom, é, já temos sobre duas horas. Antes de fazermos o agradecimento final, deixa eu só dizer aqui, já, tá, já temos aí praticamente confirmado as palestras do segundo semestre. Vocês sabem, esse ano 50 anos do IBEC, então teremos cinco palestras, para combinar com 50. E vai ser bem variado. Bom, temos colegas da UFC, 
da USP, do IMPA, da UFRJ e também da Universidade da Califórnia, com um colega. Tá bom? Então, professor Semai, muito obrigado. Muito obrigado.